Hello friends, and welcome to our first LOS Kids Discovery Guide of the new season. Today, we're going to learn all about the Magic Flute, which was written by one of the most famous composers in the world, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. This is a very special concert because we are going to be performing an opera. Does anybody know what an opera is? An opera is an art form where you tell a story through music and singing. These are very dramatic and exciting performances because they feature acting, singing, costumes, props, and a full orchestra. The first opera was made in Italy over 400 years ago. They wanted to create a new way to tell stories to people where all of the words are sung. Many opera composers then and now will work with somebody called a librettist. A librettist is somebody who writes the words of the story that the composer is creating music with. A composer and a librettist have a very special relationship. They need to work together to create something amazing, like the opera we're going to hear about today. Opera performers need to sing and practice in a very special way so that they can be loud enough to perform with the whole orchestra and in giant concert halls without any microphones. Let's hear from a very special guest who is going to share a little bit about herself and her life as a professional singer. I've always been shy. I confess that I'm shy. Can't you guess that this confident air is a mask that I wear because I'm shy. And that's my favorite song to sing right now. What's your name and how old are you? My name is Taryn Kuzma and I am 27 years old. When did you first start singing opera? I started singing opera in high school actually. So I first started singing musical theater and that's very similar to opera, but there's a bit more dancing and acting, which I also love to do. And through musical theater, I found that opera was so cool because you not only get to sing so, so, so much without a microphone, which I think is like a superpower, but then you also get to sing in different languages that you may not get to speak every day. So I found that really fascinating. And from there, that's how I started singing opera. What is the first song you learned how to sing? The first song I learned how to sing was definitely a Ukrainian song. I myself am Ukrainian. My whole family is uh, either from Ukraine or my grandparents, all four of my grandparents came over from Ukraine um, after World War II. And so I grew up singing a lot of Ukrainian music and it's a huge part of who I am as a singer and as an artist. And so the first song I think I ever learned to sing was A Christmas Carol. And uh, I think it's a song about the baby Jesus and how the, the heaven and the earth are rejoicing that baby Jesus is, is being born. And it's very beautiful. And then it keeps going, you know, describing who is celebrating, you know, Christmas and um, all those fun things. So, yeah, I think that was the first song I remember learning and singing. How do you practice singing opera? That's a really good question. So opera singing is a little bit different because unlike when you're practicing instruments in an orchestra or a band, you can't really see your instrument inside your body. Your your instrument is your vocal vocal cords. And fun fact, your vocal cords are actually the size of your thumbnail. So they're very small. They're this really tiny muscle in your um, in your larynx. And so the thing is, you kind of have to guess what the right amount to practice is. And it's actually really 
unhealthy. Some people say, you know, in order to practice an instrument, in order to get better, you have to practice, practice, practice for many, many hours. But with singing, if we practiced for like four hours at a time, we would really hurt our instrument. We would really hurt our voice because our voices aren't meant to sing like, like four hours a day. That's not normal. So I tend to break up my practicing into small half an hour um, kind of slots where I do a bit of warming up in the morning usually and I do a lot of just any exercises to get my breath working because the breath is the main important thing with singing and I tend to really focus on one aspect at a time. Am I focusing on my breath? Am I focusing on my text, on my words that I have to sing? Or am I focusing on my character? And that tends to be a much more effective way of practicing. So instead of practicing a lot of music over a long time, like three, four hours, I'm really only practicing maybe one to two hours a day in small little chunks so that I don't overwork my voice and so that I can practice um, in a very focused way that really puts a lot of good work into the practice instead of a lot of practice. <laughs> we are so excited to be featuring Taryn in the upcoming LOS Kids Opera, Mozart's Magic Flute. Let's learn a little bit about this story now. This text was written by a librettist named Emanuel Schikaneder, who is a close colleague of Mozart and a famous writer and actor of his time. The Magic Flute is a fairy tale about adventure, love, and finding the truth in a confusing world. This story follows the adventures of Tamino, a lost prince who quickly falls in love with the beautiful princess Pamina. In order to be with her, our prince has to travel and save her from Sarastro, who has kidnapped her from her mother, the Queen of the Night. Luckily, our hero Tamino has lots of help. Before starting his quest, he is given a magic flute. When the prince plays this melody, He is able to tame all of the animals in the forest. He brings this magical instrument with him for the whole opera, and through the power of music, he is able to summon all different kinds of magic to help him with his quest. The Prince Tamino is also joined by a very comical character named Papageno, who is a bird catcher. Let's listen to a little bit of Papageno's music to get to know this character better. Papagina, Papagina, Papagina. Weichen, Torchen, meine Schöne, vergebens. Ach, sie ist verloren. Ich bin zum Unglück schon geboren. Ich plauderte, plauderte. Und das war schlecht. Und drum geschieht es mir schon recht. Drum geschieht es mir schon recht. To help tell this story, Mozart wrote the music for each character to be a little bit different. Because Papageno is very funny and silly, his music focuses on simple melodies that feel light and happy. Another character in this opera who has very different music to Papageno is the Queen of the Night. One of the most famous songs from this opera is her aria. An aria is a part of an opera where one character sings a song by themselves. These are normally very passionate and lyrical moments where something emotional and dramatic is happening in the story. Let's listen to a little bit of the Queen of the Night's aria.
hardest songs for an opera singer to learn. Because the queen is feeling lots of rage and anger, the music is very fast and high, which is extremely hard for even professional singers. Mozart wrote this aria to be premiered by his sister-in-law, who was known to be a virtuoso, or very, very good at her instrument. I had so much fun learning all about opera and the magic flute with you all. Let's go back over some of the things that we learned. We went over what an opera is, who a librettist is, and what an aria is. We also had a sneak peek at what's going to be featured in the magic flute, but there is so much more amazing music and fun characters to discover. I can't wait till we get to see this production together. Now we're going to welcome back Taryn. This time she's going to share a little bit about the bandura. This is a beautiful instrument that we don't get to hear very often. And I'm so excited for all of us to learn about this. singer, but another big part of who I am as a musician is an instrumentalist on this very fancy looking instrument called a bandura. Can you say bandura? Good. Awesome. You got it. So the bandura is from a country called Ukraine, which you may have heard of in the news lately as being a pretty scary place to be. This is the national instrument of Ukraine, and it is a beautiful instrument with lots of strings on it, and it's fully acoustic, which means it doesn't need any amplification. It doesn't need to be plugged into any speakers. And the sound comes out of this space right here, and it resonates really loud. And the bandura has these low bass strings. That's my lowest string on the bandura. And then it has these very high, twinkly high strings. That's my highest string. So all together, I play the right and the left hand together. Together, you play the right and the left hand together and it makes this beautiful large sound. The bandura is from Ukraine as I said but originally it was a much smaller instrument with a lot fewer strings and that instrument was called a kobza and the kobza was a much smaller instrument that you would play kind of in front like this. I can't really do it with my bandura because it's a little too big for, me, for that. And the kobza was originally played in Ukraine. Um, it started appearing in the 1600s and the 1700s, and mainly those instruments were played by blind minstrels. And they were called kobzars. And kobzars would take their instrument from village to village in Ukraine, and they would use their instrument and their music to tell stories like what's the news from the village over or let me tell you the legend of someone and that's how they would make their living was these blind minstrels would learn this instrument and they would learn songs just by ear they couldn't see music in front of them so they had to learn it orally and they would learn these pieces and they would support themselves through this instrument and in the 1900s we started seeing a lot more people who weren't necessarily blind minstrels they started uh, adding on strings to the instrument they started adding wood so you'll see that my instrument um, it has this beautiful i think this is cherry wood on the back and it started becoming a bit more like a piano so the kobzas of the older times, those would have many fewer strings and not as much, um, not as much capabilities to play uh, certain pieces. 
Whereas this instrument that I have today, it's actually a lot like a piano. So if you'll remember from music class, you'll remember the white keys on a piano. And if you see the strings closer to the bottom of this bridge, I will play these strings just one by one and you'll hear a scale. That sounds like do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, di, do. And as I move higher up on these strings, the strings will cross over and that, those will be like the black keys on a piano. So if I play them together, so you'll hear that it's kind of, okay, those are kind of like the white keys on a piano. And this is kind of, and the strings up here are kind of like the black keys on a piano. And so that's the bandura that you see in front of you today. We're going to be reading I Am Mozart II, The Lost Genius of Maria Anna Mozart, with words by Audrey Des and pictures by Adelina Lirius. To everyone who has heard of my famous younger brother, Wolfgang, but has never heard of me. Papa always had a violin tucked under his chin. When his friends came to our home in Salzburg, they made music for the angels. I knew I had to make music too. Please, Papa, teach me to play the harpsichord. I climbed onto the wooden bench. Papa placed each of my fingers on a smooth ivory key. Using one finger at a time, I pressed down hard, each key saying back to me in its own special voice. I practiced for hours each day. In no time, music poured out of me like water over the river banks in springtime, confident, wild, carefree, Wolfgang always wanted to do everything I did, so Papa taught him too. Within a few months, we were playing side by side, 
faster and faster, memorizing more and more difficult pieces. By the time I was 10, Papa bragged that I was the best child musician in Europe. He arranged for me to play in concert halls of Munich, Linz, and Paris. Wolfie came along to play the easier pieces. At first, my hands shook. What if I made a mistake? But each time we performed, applause filled the room. By the time we reached Paris, my fears had disappeared. We stopped in Vienna to perform for the Empress, Maria Theresa. Wolfie and I played blindfolded. The audience begged for more. So much fuss over a silly trick that wasn't the least bit hard to do. The Empress was kinder than she looked. She sent us fancy clothes and filled Papa's pouch with gold coins. Back in Salzburg, Papa gave us new pieces to play, more difficult and exciting than anything we had seen before. I could hear the music before my fingers touched the keys. These notes needed me, and I needed them. Together, we would bring their magic into the world. Wolfie and I practiced all day. Two bodies, four hands, one perfect purpose. Months later, we packed our valises again. This time, we made a grand tour, playing in cities from Munich to London to Lyon. During the long, bumpy carriage rides from town to town, Wolfie and I invented a magical kingdom. It had a secret language and no grown-ups. I also did something else that was just a little bit naughty. When we were not practicing or performing, I wrote music. At a concert in London, Wolfie played one of my sonatas. I curtsied shyly as the audience applauded. Wolfie beamed with pride, but off to the side, Papa fumed. Girls were not allowed to compose. He ordered me never to write music again. And that night, I prayed for God to make me a boy. Soon after we returned home, Papa planned our next tour. But something was different. When I practiced, he didn't compliment the lift of my wrists or fuss over the crescendos in my sonatas. You and Mama will stay here. You are 18, soon you will marry. Marry? Music was my only love. Please, Papa, let me come with you. I played the most difficult pieces for him. Perfect, every one. Wolfie watched, helpless against Papa's powerful and fearful of his anger. We both knew Papa's decision was final. The day Papa and Wolfie set out for Italy, there was no music in my heart. They were away for months or years at a time. While they were gone, I wrote sonatas and concertos. I couldn't help it. The music in my head begged to be free. Wolfie and I sent each other our compositions. He said my work was brilliant. So was his. Years later, Wolfie invited Papa and me to Munich to hear his new opera, Idomeneo. But that was not the best part. After Munich, we would perform together in Augsburg. It had been years since Papa had allowed me to play in public. Wolfie and I sat close, our arms weaving over and under each other in an elaborate dance across the keyboard. My heart soared. After the performance, Wolfie pulled me aside. Come with me to Vienna, he pleaded. We could give concerts together. Again, girls are writing music now. You could too. But it was not to be. A daughter could not disobey her father. Once we returned home, Wolfie's letters came less frequently. Without word from my dear brother, 
it became harder for me to write music. My heart felt cold and empty. Papa arranged for me to marry a man from St. Gilgen who had no love for music. Without music, my heart had no home. On the day I received word that Wolfie had died, it was as if the blood in my own veins stopped flowing. He was my best friend. Through music, we shared one heart. I ran my fingers over the compositions he had sent me years ago. Could the genius who had written those melodies really be gone? I returned to Salzburg after my husband died. It seemed ages since I had played the harpsichord, but when I laid my fingers on the keys, music poured through my hands. My heart had not forgotten its first true love. I was, after all, a Mozart.